Welcome. I'd like to welcome you all to this year's Institute in Law and Economics Distinguished Jurist Lecture. As I'm sure all of you in this room know, uh, the Institute of Law and Economics, which is a joint institute between the Law School and the Wharton School, is really a shining example of both the interdisciplinary strengths and spirit of the University of Pennsylvania. It was originally founded in the 1970s, and it now runs really an extraordinary range of innovative programs, including the labor and corporate roundtables, the joint law and finance department's lectures, the law and entrepreneurship lectures, uh, a variety of wonderful academic conferences. The list goes on and on. The Distinguished Jurist Lecture is typically one of the highlights of the school year. And that certainly holds true today as we welcome uh, this year's speaker, Seventh Circuit Judge Richard A. Posner. This is the second time Judge Posner has delivered the Distinguished Jurist uh, Lecture. He is the first recidivist lecture in the two decades of this series. There is a very simple reason. Judge Posner is an epic figure. He's not only one of the most influential judges in the country, he's one of the most influential academics and thinkers over the last 30 years. Colleagues have called him a brilliant heretic, an awesome intellect, and a man who has, quote, refuted more conceptual errors than St. Augustine. <laughs> as we also all know, he was first known as the guiding light of the law and economics movement. When he began his career as an academic, it was thought radical to apply the principles of economics to law. But that was before Judge Posner legitimized the new interdisciplinary field with the publication of his now classic text, Economic Analysis of Law. The book was bold and prescient, erudite and exhaustive, much like the author who has been rattling cages ever since as a public intellectual who stirs debate with his never-ending stream of ideas. Today, Judge Posner is as apt to draw on Nietzsche's creed of self-determination and read the classics in Greek as he is to declaim about problems with intelligence reforms in the wake of 9-11. Independent and unpredictable, Judge Posner takes issue with judicial activists and strict constructionists. He is, in short, a strikingly original thinker, but I hasten to add, not an originalist. Judge Posner's extraordinary eclecticism owes in part to his broad experience. His life divides into two chapters, academia and jurisprudence, but they actually merge into one. After graduating at the top of his class from Harvard Law School, where he was president of the Law Review, Judge Posner was a clerk for Justice William Brennan. He remained in Washington to serve in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, and then embarked on his storied academic career at the University of Chicago Law School, where he was a professor from 1969 through 1981. Today, Judge Posner remains a senior lecturer at Chicago Law School. It is in this free market intellectual environment that Judge Posner hones his economic worldview, arguing in books and articles that the law ought to bend to economic efficiency and the production of wealth. It is also where he founded the Journal of Legal Studies, which looks at theoretical and empirical research on law and legal institutions from an interdisciplinary perspective. In 1981, President Reagan appointed Judge Posner to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, Circuit uh, Seventh Circuit, and he served as chief judge from 1993 to 2000. Judge Posner's career on the bench has been in many respects an extension of his academic engagements. His well-crafted opinions read like literature, elegant and broad. A disciple of Judge Learned Hand, Judge Posner is a pragmatist with a libertarian streak, famously expressed in his words, your rights end where his nose begins. In establishing this enviable record, he's published more opinions than any judge of his era, on average over 75 a year, nearly three times the national norm. His opinions are cited far more than any other sitting judge and four times more than the average federal judge. Not surprisingly, he's also been called, quote, the preeminent judicial theorist of our time. But that is only one part of his public portfolio. 
As his night job, Judge Posner has also become a truly extraordinary public scholar and intellectual, exploring with erudition virtually every single topic of contemporary importance. In this role, he has published some 38 books on everything under the sun, from the economics of criminal law, sexuality and old age, the law and literature, antitrust law, and intellectual property. It would be foolish for me or anyone else to attempt to capture the full breadth and originality of this Renaissance intellect in an introduction. It can't be done. If Judge Posner did not exist, says one pundit, it would be hard to believe he could. <laughs> Suffice it to say that in all of his writings, he employs a pragmatic, creative, yet provocative approach. In the process, he illuminates what one person has called the blind spots and the phony affirmations of our standard professional understandings. Seemingly no subject escapes Judge Posner's gaze. As Judge Pierre Lobau puts it, he writes books faster than I can read them. His life and times would make a fitting subject for a long book. And of course, Judge Posner will probably write that book over one of these weekends. He's also received essentially every major award and honor the Academy confers, including honorary degrees from uh, major leading academic ins institutions, including this one. It's not surprising that his full body of work has been rightfully called the richest since Oliver Wendell Holmes. In today's lecture, Judge Posner turns his attention to the embattled corporation. I can assure you, I can assure you that his insights will be thoughtful, pragmatic, and provocative. Please join me in welcoming a brilliant jurist, a, a recidivist uh, scholar um, before this group, and a seminal voice in the law and economics movement, the Honorable Richard Posner. Uh, thank you very much. Dean Fitz, pleasure to be here. You know, there are only two types of introduction. In the first, the introducer overpraises the speaker, uh, raising expectations which are shattered as soon as the speech begins. In the second, the introducer, by his wit and vividness, articulateness, um, uh, shows that really you've got the you know, roles reversed. This is the person you came to listen to. So Dean Fitz has actually managed to combine both of those modes <laughs> in his introduction. So quickly trying to lower your expectations. Maybe you'll be pleasantly surprised. The origin of this talk is um, in the fact that I've been updating my textbook treatise, uh, Economic Analysis of Law. It's only revised a few years ago. Uh, the sixth edition was published in 2003. It's a little early to be revising it, but the publisher wanted me to. And uh, in the course of revision, when I came to my chapters on corporations and financial markets, I realized that in a uh, significant part they had been obsoleted by the events of the last few years, both events in the real world and events in, uh, in scholarship. And uh, that's, so I've, I've been led to rethink some of the things I've said in the book, and I'm going to share my uh, rethinking with you today. I'm going to focus on uh, CEO compensation, but at the end I'll say a few words about securities uh, regulation. Well, I want to start with just a brief sketch of the, of the theory of the firm, very, very brief, uh, and emphasize that it's really the, it's the control problem that uh, defines the firm and limits its, its size. If you're ever curious why there's more than one firm in the economy, uh, the reason isn't um, diminishing returns, which just limit the amount of a given product that a firm can efficiently uh, produce. Um, what limits the size of the firm is that the span of supervision of, of a single person is limited. And that means the more employees a firm has, the more supervisors it has to have. And the more supervisors it has to have, the more supervisors of supervisors it has to have. Because just as the first line supervisor's span of control is limited, so as you go up the tiers of the hierarchy, each supervisory uh, official 
uh, can supervise only a small group of supervisors uh, below him. So as the hierarchy lengthens out, tier, tier upon tier, uh, you get delay in executing orders, loss of information, uh, information garbled, attenuation of the directions emanating from the top. So coherence uh, diminishes and eventually uh, overwhelms whatever advantages there were to uh, having a large organization. Uh, moreover, the larger the organization, larger and more complex, the more difficult it will be to correlate the work of a particular employee with um, the value of the organization's output. And that will make it difficult to align the employee's incentives with that of the, of that of the firm. And um, with, that, with that lack of alignment, employees will have greater scope to engage in activities that benefit uh, themselves but not not the firm. And that's the problem that economists discuss under the rubric of agency costs. So you have a principal and an agent. principal would like the agent to do exactly what the principal wants, but uh, the agent has his own uh, interests, and to the extent that uh, the control by the principal is, is imperfect, the agent may be able to stray from the principal's directions. Now, if you look at the economy as a whole, you see that economic activity is coordinated by a combination of, of the market and other voluntary arm's length transactions, sometimes not arm's length, sometimes family, friendship, altruism, and so on, but also, of course, by organizations. You have both the macro order, which is the market, and the micro order of the individual organizations uh, within the market. And it used to seem to many people that since organizations are about organizing, um, the optimal way of organizing the entire market would be to have a central planner who would uh, tell everybody what to do. And um, uh, Friedrich Hayek famously argued, and the collapse of communism uh, showed, that uh, this, this didn't work, that... Um, uh, it is very difficult, actually, to uh, uh, pool through organization the knowledge that all the members of the economic uh, community have. Um, a manager of a complex system simply will not know everything that he needs to know in order to optimize the organization's uh, activities. And so you need decentralized methods of coordination, in particular the market, in which price becomes the, the signal, the kind of embodiment of what each uh, individual in the market uh, knows. So price is the mechanism by which a private information is diffused throughout the market and ultimately throughout the entire economy. So you lack that uh, uh, signaling device when you're inside an organization. There you substitute directions for negotiations guided by uh, price. Um, and that uh, uh, brings me to, this, to the issue of uh, compensation. Uh, since you're not buying the output of an individual employee within, within the firm, uh, you, you, you have to figure out you know, what, his, what his output is worth in order to know what to, what to pay him. Well, in the simplest economic model of compensation, a worker right up to the level of a CEO of a giant corporation is paid as marginal product, which is essentially his contribution to the uh, firm's net income. But if you look at the actual compensation structures of, of firm, the firms, they, they deviate from that. Um, you observe that wages uh, vary across employees of the same rank and same job classification by much less than the difference in their contribution to the company. This is regardless of whether they're unionized workers. And you also observe that, observe that employees who do satisfactory work can expect to have uh, regular annual wage increases uh, regardless of whether their contribution to the firm is actually uh, increasing. Uh, eventually, uh, as the worker gets near retirement, 
his or her contribution uh, to, to the firm may actually be declining, and yet the worker will still expect uh, annual increases or certainly no uh, decreases. But if you think about these anomalies, they, they can be uh, explained. Um, this horizontal wage compression may simply reflect the difficulty of measuring individual uh, contributions to output, especially when people are working in teams. Uh, and the trick is to keep the team small enough that uh, the members can observe each other and um, if, if they're shirking by one of them can report it to, to a supervisor. Um, and an interesting device that one observes throughout the economy and, and in universities and elsewhere is that uh, even, if you, even if you can't actually evaluate the contribution that individual members of a team make to, to the team's uh, production, often it's obvious who is the best person, right? So you may not be able to rank them, may not be able to attach a money value to the contribution of each, but you may be able to spot the, the star. And that's the basis of a promotion system. You pick out a person who, who is best and promote that person and give them a higher salary, and that way you create incentives for outstanding performance and you kind of elide the lack of knowledge you have about specific contribution to the bottom line of an individual uh, worker. And as far as the second phenomenon, is kind of vertical wage drift. Um, this may be designed sort of to match income with consumption over the life cycle. And it may also deal with what economists call the last period problem, that as a person gets up toward retirement age, uh, uh, his, his incentive to work hard for the firm and so on uh, diminishes. He knows he's not going to be promoted anymore. He's not going to be, doesn't have to make uh, a, a good impression on his bosses. So companies, employers have also sort of worry about the behavior of their last period workers. And one way to keep them uh, in line is, you know, give them, uh, uh, give them their, uh, keep giving them higher wages every year, and then at the end, you know, give them some generous uh, pension benefits. Uh, so, so we can, we can uh, tinker with the, the actual observed uh, compensation patterns in, in firms to try to uh, uh, make them fit the basic model of, of compensation. And we can't actually... Companies can't actually pay each worker marginal product, but, but you can explain the deviations and, and discuss substitutes that companies use, such as promotion. Well, but can this standard model of compensation, even refined in this fashion, uh, can it explain the compensation of corporate uh, CEOs? I'm, I'm skeptical about that. So American CEOs are paid about twice as much on average as their counterparts in other countries. Um, and yet this is not because Americans at all levels uh, earn more than their foreign counterparts. The difference between average U.S. and foreign wages is much smaller uh, below the uh, CEO and other senior management level. Um, sort of the proximate cause of this difference is that American CEO incomes contain a much uh, a higher fraction of um, uh, non-salary income, uh, bonuses, uh, and in particular stock options. Uh, these uh, methods of, of, sort of irregular methods of compensation, particularly stock options, uh, have a degree of uncertainty associated with them. And uh, that creates risk. We know that most people are risk averse and we know that actually corporate executives have a particular uh, reason to be risk averse, which is that a lot of their human capital is tied up in the particular company. They'd be worth much less working elsewhere. So they don't want to lose their jobs. And uh, so they, will, they, will, they don't want to see their incomes bouncing up and down too much. So um, they have to be compensated for bearing risk. So if much of their income is in risky uh, a form such as stock options, options, they will demand a higher wage. But the adjustment that would be necessary to compensate them is much less than the difference between their incomes and that of their uh, foreign counterparts. 
A more persuasive explanation for the difference is that a stock ownership tends to be more concentrated in foreign countries than in the United States. And um, the fewer shareholders there are in a company, the more incentive each of them or group of them has to uh, monitor the compensation of the people actually uh, uh, running the company. Um, and this uh, uh, inference is supported by the fact that the stock option, when you think about it, is not, not really a, a very uh, uh, tailored way of motivating chief executive officers to, to do their best. Because a lot of things af affect the price of stock other than uh, the efforts of the CEO. Um, so to tie a CEO's income to his um, to the to the value of his company's stock, a little like if the president of the United States, the salary of the president of the United States, was tied to uh, a GNP. Now, as we th think, then, if if stock options really aren't that uh, a great an incentive device, well, why why do they feature so prominently in the incomes of of our CEOs? And um, uh, one reason may be that. The, uh, uh, the, these options, unlike the, the income, the value of the options, unlike the, the salary that's paid to a corporate executive, doesn't have to be reported as a corporate expense, even though it, it really is. Now, the security analysts and the large stockholders who, who do monitor the performance of executives, they, they can figure out what these options are likely to cost the company. Um, and you'd think that the, the, the knowledge they obtain would diffuse throughout the market so that it would, the fact that it wasn't reported on an on a accounting statement as an expense wouldn't make any difference to the value of the company. But I'm going to be discussing uh, evidence that the capital markets are not as efficient as some of us used to think, and therefore um, uh, a failures of disclosure, even though Rather, rather superficial in the sense that the knowledge is out there somewhere, may, may in fact uh, affect stock prices. When you look at the incentive of a board of, a board of directors to rein in a CEO compensation, uh, that is, is weak. The, the board of directors in general as a control device is, has actually many of the same weaknesses as congressional committees as oversight uh, for, executive, for the executive branch of government. Um, the directors are part-timers. Uh, their incentives to um, vigorously police executive salaries are, are weak. And the boards tend to be dominated by, by other CEOs. And it's just natural, both psychologically and, and economically, for someone who is a highly paid CEO to think that the CEO of the company on whose board he sits should also be uh, a highly paid. So I've presented some reasons for thinking that uh, uh, American CEOs may actually, on average, be overcompensated in terms of the actual value of their contribution to the firm. But there's been a, a major challenge to this kind of skeptical thinking in a recent paper, not, not published yet, but an important paper by Xavier Gabay and Augustin Landier. And what they say is simply that the, uh, uh, the high, very high incomes of American CEOs and the growth of those incomes in recent decades reflects nothing more than the fact that um, uh, the market value of their firms is very great and, and growing. And this uh, very simple uh, argument actually returns us to the simple marginal product theory of uh, 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 worker payment. Uh, the idea is simply the chief executive of a more fat, valuable firm, if he can increase the value of that firm by some percentage, the absolute increase in the firm's value will be greater the more, the more valuable the firm is. So if there are two equally skilled managers, and one manages a grocery store and the other manages IBM, the latter is probably uh, creating greater value, right? 1% increase in the, 
uh, value of IBM much more than 1% increase in the value of the grocery store. But there is an alternative explanation for this correlation between market values and uh, CEO compensation, which is simply that the, the more valuable the, the firm is in particular, um, the more rapid it's, uh, the growth of its market value, the easier it is to hide the compensation of the chief executives. And so this is sort of complementary to the notion of stock options as a way of hiding the cost to firms of their uh, CEOs. So suppose a 10% uh, fir firm's value increases by 10% and the board of directors increases the CEO's salary by 3%. Um, the percentage of the firm's value that is going to the CEO will decrease because the market value is growing by a larger percentage than his income. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so the, the percentage of the firm's value that goes to pay its CEO will actually be diminishing, but it's increasing for him, of course, and it may be increasing beyond anything that uh, a market in CEOs would uh, would would demand. And here may be a partial explanation of this curious phenomenon that uh, a corporate mergers so often fail to increase the value of the acquiring firm. It increases its size, but not its value. But you can see how from the CEO standpoint, uh, the larger the enterprise you control, the larger income you can appropriate without its uh, uh, becoming such a large fraction of the total income of the corporation that uh, shareholders, directors, and so on uh, begin to uh, uh, object. There is one more theory of executive compensation, very interesting, Want to want to mention very briefly. And this says that the key managerial skill in the modern American corporation is not the ability to run a company well. It's the ability to use public relations skills and accounting uh, leisure demand to um, create a bubble in the corporation's stock. And the argument is the, the more the corporation's stock is worth, the more the CEO can jack up the value of the stock, the lower the cost to the corporation of acquiring additional capital either by acquiring other firms or by issuing new shares, and also the lower the cost of attracting uh, good uh, executives. Um, if this analysis is correct, has merit, then it is efficient to base a CEO's compensation on the performance of the corporation's stock rather than on the company's fundamentals, such as its profits and revenues and costs. But it's probably efficient in a private rather than a, a social sense, right? These bubbles uh, burst eventually. So the, the gains are, are temporary, and they really switch wealth around among companies rather than uh, producing uh, uh, aggregate gains in, in wealth. Those you could only get by better management. Now, the, the concern with excessive CEO compensation is at one end of a spectrum of criticism of corporations, the other end of which, of course, is occupied by these high-profile criminal prosecutions and convictions of uh, uh, senior managers of major corporations. And you, you, you're familiar, I'm sure, with these and with the Sarb Sarbani's Oxley Act of 2002 as a, as a reaction. Um, and what is interesting from perspective of my talk today is uh, how many of the recurrent types of misbehavior of which corporate uh, managers are accused, and this is not all criminal by any means, um, but most of these, uh, I say, recurrent types of misbehavior relate quite directly to the issue of a CEO compensation. So they include well, what I mentioned already, the failure to treat the value of stock options as a corporate liability, which is kind of concealment of um, uh, incomes of high-level uh, management. Um, the failure to disclose in the company's financial statements the cost of non-pecuniary benefits to officers, including retired officers, such as use of company aircraft and residences, 
And um, the sort of thing that came out in the, in the Jack Welch divorce, remember, uh, 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 preceding the, the, the flowers, the basketball tickets, all these strange uh, perks. A third, um, failure to disclose loans by corporations to their officers or the subsequent forgiveness of the loans. And again, a kind of concealment. Uh, inadequate supervision of management by boards of directors, including inadequate policing of uh, overly generous compensation packages. Um, Lately, uh, we have the backdating of, of, of stock options in order to um, uh, enable them to, to, be, uh, to be cashed. Uh, not clear how, how, whether this is particularly uh, a, a device used to benefit um, the, the highest level of corporate executives. But um, again, it's, it's part of the... the or, or it, it triggers uh, the, the concern with the stock option as a, as a device. Another is that there are complaints that stock options uh, cause managers to try to uh, manipulate short-term fluctuations in the value of their stock to make sure that the options uh, have value. Um, There, there are, of course, a number of other abuses that are, that are charged, which are not directly related to um, the uh, a corporate compensation, those special, uh, special uh, entities in the, in the Enron case and the you know, preferential allocation of IPO shares to uh, people who can steer underwriting business to the investment bank and so on. But... Um, but, but clearly, uh, compensation-related abuses is a, is a big part of the, of the picture. Um, now, one basic question that economists always want to ask about um, uh, uh, wealth uh, transfers is whether these really represent social costs or mere rearrangements of the of the of the pie, you're just slicing the pie differently, maybe creating greater inequality of wealth, or you're making the pie smaller by imposing real costs. Um, probably uh, uh, most of the effect of the overcompensation of CEOs would be a wealth effect, a wealth transfer from shareholders to executives, but there are probably real costs as well. And what what economists say is if you have if you have very, um, um, uh, if you have you know lucrative opportunities, uh, you will irrationally incur costs in order to uh, be able to exploit that opportunity. You will invest in in trying to uh, uh, get that pot of gold. That's what's called rent seeking. So rent seeking are costs that result from a desire for uh, for wealth. And in the case of this excessive CEO compensation, you can have uh, a cost of various sort, uh, uh, of which probably the most important is that to the extent that corporate earnings are reduced, even, even modestly, because of uh, uh, deflection or, or you know, re reallocation of wealth from shareholders, um, uh, common stocks become less attractive forms of investment, and investors shift to other forms which may be socially more socially less productive, but become more attractive as uh, corporations are are looted. Um, now, corporation law has has long been. Um, alert to the uh, concern about the uh, appropriation of the corporation's income by its executives. And, you know, there are all sorts of devices that are used, um, uh, all kinds of accounting requirements. Of course, the board of directors elected by the shareholders. Um, and there are many private uh, uh, methods by which uh, 
market tries to control these abuses, analysts and brokerage firms and, and the like. Uh, but these turn out to be highly uh, imperfect controls. And you know, I've mentioned the uh, limitations on what a, a board of directors can, can do. Um, the role of the auditor is uh, uh, one of a built-in conflict of interest where the, um, um, where the corporation uh, pays the auditor that's supposed to monitor its, its uh, behavior. So the people hiring the auditor are the people whom the auditor is supposed to be watching. Now, the auditors have professional and legal obligations, but there is a kind of uh, inherent conflict of interest. And uh, one way Sarbanes Oxley tries to deal with this is by uh, severing um, the, by, by saying that the firms are not to uh, buy consulting services from the auditors. But it's hard to see that as an important control because if auditors somehow um, are in a position to sell favorable uh, audits to their clients, um, they can sell in the form of high auditing fees rather than in some combination of auditing fees and consulting fees, although there may be some element of concealment if they can do the latter. Now, we used to think that any of these uh, abuses resulting from weaknesses in the sort of internal uh, disciplinary structure of a corporation would be canceled by competition in the product market. That um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, firms that uh, were wasting resources on you know, excessively paid uh, 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 CEOs would be losing, um, uh, losing sales to their competitors and losing investors to other investment opportunities. But if you have a market dominated by large firms, and if, as I think, this problem of control within a corporation is, is something that afflicts every large organization, then you'll find all the firms in the market in essentially the same position, uh, all of them uh, having to incur this uh, significant agency cost because of their size and complexity. And then corporation will have no uh, tendency to eliminate that uh, cost. Uh, what uh, can be done about this? Um, very unclear. Uh, I mentioned what seemed to me a kind of idle, a largely idle gesture by Congress and Sarbanes Oxley Act in uh, uh, limiting, you know, hi hiring your auditor to do consulting as well. You know, even before that, of course, Arthur Anderson had split its auditing from its consulting, split them into separate companies, which is the tendency, because actually auditing and consulting are such different uh, activities that it's extremely awkward to place them in, in the same firm. There's a, a thesis in organizational economics that you don't want to have uh, incompatible cultures within the same organization because uh, it will be very difficult to establish incentive schemes, compensation, and so on, that will um, uh, uh, make people in each of the different uh, cultures uh, comfortable with being in that firm. In fact, uh, if you have two tracks in, in a firm, and one is, is the more attractive for whatever reason, your best people will go into that, and your, the, other, the other track will tend to wither better to have it split off in a separate firm which can develop its own, you know, can optimize its incentive and uh, control mechanisms to the particular characteristics of its, of its work. And, the, and, and of course, we've seen from all the prosecutions, most of which are under you know, laws, the law as it existed before Sarbanes-Oxley, that our standard fraud laws uh, are able to cope with um, the, the egregious forms of corporate misconduct. And the ones that aren't egregious probably can't be dealt with effectively by uh, law at all. Well, what is um, uh, the, the uh, perhaps most important factor 
in my rethinking about the, the problem of control within the corporation is the uh, challenge to the efficient markets theory of, uh, of capital markets by a behavioral finance. Um, in the, my previous editions of my book, I, I defended a very strong form of the efficient market uh, theory. Uh, one implication of which is that investors um, should focus on uh, diversification rather than on trying to time market turns or pick uh, stocks because tactics like that reduce diversification, increase transaction costs, uh, and don't generate any positive, uh, even gross return, let alone net return, because of the uh, uh, information circulates so quickly and accurately in the market that you really can't uh, uh, beat it. Uh, I still, I think the efficient market theory is, I think, I think most economists agree, it still uh, retains substantial explanatory value. It's guided important legal reforms, which I continue to think are, are uh, a sound, such as what's really revolutionary reform of trust investment law over the past uh, 30 years um, that has allowed trustees to adopt the kind of passive strategy that the efficient market theory commends, where you buy a acquire a diversified portfolio of securities, but the only trading you do, you know, unless you need cash, something of that sort, is the trading necessary to maintain uh, diversification. Uh, and that way, um, uh, you, you eliminate all diversifiable risk, and that, uh, that diversifiable risk is not compensated, and therefore, you're ahead of the game, and you save the transaction costs of the kind of futile effort to beat the, the market. Um, now, everyone recognized, even in the sort of heyday of the efficient market theory, un, unchallenged as yet by behavioral finance, that there was a lot of irrationality and ignorance in, uh, in the market. There were the you know, traders who traded on noise, and the people who created these strange head and shoulder patterns, you know, the technical traders, uh, they seemed uh, nuts. But it was assumed that, that these deviations from rationality were random. And if they were random, um, they wouldn't uh, affect the average price of securities. They'd just be a little, a little bit of noise. Uh, and even if they were systematic rather than random deviations, it was thought that their bad effects would be undone by, by arbitrageurs. So arbitrage, you know, is a form of speculation that takes the form. You look for two very similar things that are selling for different prices when they should be selling for the same price, or at least the, sh the spread should be uh, smaller. And um, uh, by, uh, you know, and if, if you recognize that uh, this is not an equilibrium, that, that something's wrong with this spread, it's too big, then you can uh, make money uh, and also uh, you can eliminate, and by your, your efforts, you eliminate the disequilibrium. So a very simple example is how arbitrageurs exploit price discrimination. If you have a firm that's selling at a uh, high price to consumers that, you know, believe to have a... Uh, uh, a low elasticity of demand and a low price, the same product to consumers who have high elasticity of demand, the uh, arbitrageur may buy from the uh, low elasticity sellers, I'm sorry, the high elasticity sellers, the, the low price, resell it to the uh, people who are paying the high price, make money doing that, buying cheap, selling, selling dear, the same product, but at the same time, gradually erasing the difference, bringing the market back to equilibrium. Well, the way this works in a uh, securities market, again, you have, suppose, two uh, uh, stocks that's of companies which seem, you know, really identical in terms of expected returns and risk and so on, but they're selling at very different prices, and you suspect that that's an irrational difference. Uh, so if you, if you sell... Uh, one of these short, 
and buy uh, the longer one, um, and, and you're you know, confident that these really are, are close substitutes, um, you will um, you know, probably be able to make money um, with a relatively low, low risk. So if you, short, you sell short the one you think is going to drop, you're buying the other one, the substitute. If you're right and it drops, um, well, you, you, you make money on that. And it's true, the, this, the, the price of the other one may be rising to meet it. Uh, or may, no, I'm sorry, the, the other one may be falling as well. But uh, if the other one was, by hypothesis, undervalued relative to the one you're selling short, then it won't fall as much as the first. So, so arbitrage, arbitrage involves a hedging. It's speculation. It's hedge speculation. And it ought to uh, be a profitable way of eliminating any systematic deviations from rationality in the market. Um, well, what the behavioral, the behavioral finance people like Andre Schleifer, a very, very uh, distinguished economist, who has written extensively on this, done a lot of research on it with others. What, what they, they have shown two things that are, that are damaging to the efficient market theory. First thing they've shown is that these irrationalities tend, in fact, to be, rather than accidents, you know, having a few idiots in the market, they have to do with, with cognitive defects that virtually all people uh, uh, suffer from or at least so many people suffer from it that it has real effects on the securities uh, market. So, for, for example, um, uh, you know, pe people have what's called loss aversion, which means they're more reluctant to sell losing stocks than winning stocks. Even though in an efficient market, any moment in time, a stock whatever the price is, that price is the best estimate of the value of the stock. It doesn't matter if it's going down or going up. But um, if it's going down, people are more likely to hold on and hope that it'll go up. If it goes up, they're more likely to uh, sell it and take their profits. That's irrational behavior, but it's so common that it affects uh, 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 the behavior of the market. Um, they are thought to demand an excessive premium for holding stocks rather than bonds because uh, stocks have more downside risk than bonds. And this loss aversion that I just mentioned implies that downside risk law is what people are, are, um, are particularly upset about. They don't feel it's fully compensated by the upside risk which comes from holding stocks because they're riskier investments. Um, a very serious problem is that people have great difficulty thinking in probabilities, terrible difficulty. And one of the things they don't understand is that runs, you know, having the same flip a coin and you flip, you know, four heads in a row, and you think that that's a pattern. Actually, it's just an accident. And so people see patterns where they don't exist. And this is why they, they seem to give uh, irrationally uh, a rational way to the short-run performance of stocks and the short-run performance of money managers. So if they think a money manager, so if they observe money manager has made money three years running, they think, great, that's a pattern. That's likely to continue, whereas it's it, probably just a matter of, uh, of luck. Um, now, in the earlier analysis, one might have... It, one might have said, well, this is fine, but the arbitrageurs will take care of this. But it turns out that uh, arbitrage uh, uh, doesn't, um, doesn't work as well as, as it used to be thought. And the reason is that um, arbitrage, remember, arbitrage is a way of, involves hedging as well as speculation. Uh, if you lose the hedging feature of it, it becomes extremely risky. And because when it's very risky, then there aren't that many uh, arbitrageurs. They keep getting broke, go, going broke, and so on. But, um, uh, but now we think that, that the hedging often doesn't work um, because, um, 
very often turns out there, there aren't these two stocks that are really good substitutes for each other, that have the identical returns and so on. Uh, the market may r regard them you know, irrationally as, as very different, and their uh, insistence on the difference between these stocks may uh, persist beyond the interval in which you can sustain a, a short selling campaign without getting wiped out. Um, now, the extent of these deviations from rationality that are due to, um, or that, that have been exposed by behavioral finance, the extent of, of the deviation of significance is, um, uh, is debated. And the remedies are very, very difficult. Uh, we, we can't have a law which says, forbids people to buy stocks without first passing a test in clear thinking. I mean, cognitive limitations that are deeply rooted in the human uh, brain <coughs> defy legal remedy. But it is important that the law not assume that people are more rational uh, than they are. Uh, and, then, <coughs> and this leads me to take a somewhat kinder view than I used to of securities uh, regulation. Uh, in a famous study, George Stigler, very great economist, found that before the federal regulation of new uh, issues uh, in beginning 1933, purchasers of those new issues fared on average as well as purchasers of new issues do today. So the SEC made no difference. <clears throat> but the empirical evidence for that conclusion was always weak. And the theoretical assumption that motivated, namely the efficiency of the securities markets, is now uh, uh, under serious attack. The issuer has much better information about his company than even uh, sophisticated outsiders, such as securities analysts, do. Uh, and the potential gains to the issuer of getting the price of the new issue up uh, very high are often so large they dominate any reputational concerns that would normally inhibit uh, sharp a dealing. Uh, Schle Andre Schleifer and his colleagues have been conducting uh, very interesting comparative studies of the uh, securities laws of the different countries in the world and correlating those laws with the uh, performance of the securities markets in those countries. And they have found that a, a, a basic security laws, securities law that simply requires the disclosure of material information uh, and provides private legal remedies, you know, like the 10b-5 suits for the failure to disclose it. So laws uh, are similar to the Securities Act of 1933 uh, brings about a net improvement in the operation of, of stock markets, though more ambitious forms of public regulation of securities markets do not. So here there's sort of new thinking about organizations, about, about the corporation, about the compensation problem, about the efficient market hypothesis uh, converge to, as I say, uh, to all, certainly alter my thinking about, um, about the corporation and to uh, provide a, a, a significant uh, defense of at least the, the, the basics of our uh, legal regime for corporations and financial markets. That was that was absolutely wonderful. Um, we had a, a sort of a romp through every issue in efficient market uh, thesis and a discussion about everything. Uh, regarding executive compensation and compensation across a whole variety of areas. Um, I assume your next talk will be on law faculty and dean salaries, and uh, I can't wait yes. to hear that. <laughs> In any event, uh, Judge Posner has uh, said he would be happy or at least willing to uh, take some questions. So sure. I'd be, um, take some questions.
go. I, I am cynical. I will. <laughs> I will grant you. I will grant you that. Um, it's it's a good working hypothesis that um, uh, uh, outside of I'm not even sure that I would need this qualification. I was going to say outside of family family settings, um, the the most powerful uh, explanations of human behavior uh, assume uh, self interest in a, in a rather narrow sense. So I wouldn't pay any attention to protestations of corporate executives or <laughs> law school deans about uh, being motivated by, by public interest. So they all have jobs to do and constituencies to respond to. And that doesn't mean they don't, they're not you know, doing great work. But uh, they do great work because of, because of environment that aligns uh, their uh, ins personal incentives with some public need. But with regard, what's interesting about these requirements for detailed disclosure of executive compensation, it really provides the acid test for the, uh, ex for the um, uh, excess compensation thesis. Because s suppose these very detailed disclosures have uh, absolutely no effect on executive salaries or investment behavior, uh, anything that can be measured. Well, that would suggest that um, the market had known all along exactly what these executives were being paid and that whatever reasons there were that the compensation uh, took um, indirect forms like uh, stock options and all these perks. Um, uh, the motivations may have been unrelated to any effort at concealment, may have had to do with taxes or uh, uh, finance and, you know, risk and so forth. Or they, um, or even if, if aimed at, at concealment, the market had seen through them and so they, they would have no, no effect. So that would be interesting to see. Um, I would be delighted if it turned out that these regulations had no effect, and then we could we could have fewer regulations. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would say Tomkin was just one to turn this into a firm at the very beginning of the talk. I was probably to begin to try and put those uh, the comparison between the corporate scene and uh, something that maybe Dan did or Dallas. Well, that's a very interesting question. No, I, I, I haven't ever tried to do anything uh, with that. I, I should. It, it is very interesting. Um, um, the law firm world, uh, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as an enterprise, commercial activity, it's, it's mysterious. Uh, it's, and what is mysterious is the growth of firms, the growth in the size of firms, which has been so dramatic, is um, a difficult for an outsider to understand. Uh, one of the things that you would think would tightly limit the growth of firms is the very severe conflict of interest rules. So the larger you are, the more conflicts you encounter. Um, if you can only have you know, one airline, if you can only represent one airline, for example, then um, uh, the, larger, the larger you grow, the more you have to create a practice of, you know, one firm in every industry. So, um, so that's, that's a puzzle. As far as the compensation within the firms is concerned, because there's a large uh, literature on that, um, uh, so some things seem, well, here's my, my one insight in law firm compensation. What one observes is a reduction in lockstep compensation, right? It used to be very common for firms to pay all the, sometimes pay all the partners the same amount or all the partners in the same seniority level 
the same amount. That had, there's still a few firms that do that, but that's become very rare in large firms. And one uh, associates that, my mind associate that with the uh, legal profession becoming more competitive. Because the more competitive a, an, in, an, an, an industry, the more pressure there is to match compensation with contribution to the extent you can. That's one of the way, you know, that's efficient use of labor. So if you, if you observe people of different productivity being paid um, uh, very similar wages, and it can't be explained by this sort of team production idea, they all have their individual practices, they're not that dependent on each other, and yet they're being paid the same and yet diff differ greatly in productivity, you think, well, that's not a very efficient labor market. And I think it is clear that the legal profession has become uh, more competitive, partly because of Supreme Court decisions that knock down barriers to competition among firms. This growing competitiveness of law firms then has, has big effects on, on compensation. Uh, it also has effects on uh, quality of service and uh, ethical standards in the legal profession because they're, in, of course, in conflict. Um, <clears throat> you're, hired, uh, you're hired as a lawyer by someone who just wants to get his way, win his case, have a, have a contract one-sided in his favor, what have you. So he'd like you to do anything, you know, murder the, <laughs> the lawyer on the other side, bribe the judge, anything. But of course you can't, you know, can't. You're, you're restrained by your ethical obligations. But the more competitive the pressure, the more kind of uh, uh, under pressure you are to interpret your ethical obligations in as uh, liberal uh, a form as, as possible. So my prediction is that as the profession has become more um, competitive, the quality of service to clients has risen, but the ethical standards of, of the profession have declined. Now, uh, that can be offset. You can have stricter uh, 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 scrutiny. You can have, and I think we've seen, we've seen some, some tendency in that direction. So you can substitute some external discipline for uh, an internal ethical obligation, a professional, a, a, a sensed professional obligation that was, this is my cynicism, that was cheaper to indulge when there was less competition. Well, uh, that's, that, that seems to me uh, uh, closely related to the question of excessive compensation. That is, suppose that, um, that, there is that, is, that there is no economic justification for the average American CEO being paid twice as much as the average foreign CEO. That would suggest that that the proper ratio, you said 400 to 1, the proper ratio would be no greater than 200 to 1. Now that would still be very high. So now the question is, suppose, suppose uh, we say that a competitive labor market will in fact pay a CEO of a major corporation 200 times as much as a worker. Is that a problem? Is that an, is that, an, now first, is that an economic problem? Well, I'm not, I don't, it's not an economic problem problem um, unless there are some secondary consequences of this inequality. That is, uh, if everybody who works is paid his or her marginal product, it is, of course, quite possible that someone's marginal product is 200 times as great as someone else's. So, that, so there's no inefficiency there. Now, uh, in, inefficiency could rise if you had a lot of envy in society, a lot of resentments, 
if um, uh, the people who were getting the paid one two hundred were were angry and and took steps uh, to to express their anger, that that would be very serious. That would be very serious. Now we haven't seen that in the United States. There's a striking lack of envy on the part of Americans. It's very interesting. I do think though that one of the reasons for the concealment of CEO uh, compensation is that companies do worry about public opinion as well as investor opinion. And uh, they would worry that if they were perceived as being too hoggish, <laughs> it might, there might be repercussions form of regulation. Now, on a purely ethical, um, in purely ethical terms, I agree with you that 200 or 400 to 1 is unjustified because, the, because, because of the extraordinary role of luck in people's economic fortunes. And there, there, there's, there are different types of luck. Some people would say, well, you know, whether, you have a, whether you're smart is luck or your genetic endowment is a matter of luck. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't go that far. Because you'd strip, a, you'd strip people of all their individuality if you said that everything, every, every asset they had, even, even their innate assets, were, um, were, were pure happenstance. But... Um, but as between two people with um, identical, you know, genetic endowments, identical abilities, um, one is is quite likely to end up, you know, with a hundred times the income because of luck. He went into he went into a field that boomed. He had no idea it was going to boom. He was just interested in it, or maybe he wasn't good at anything else. And all of a sudden, um, he's uh, he's immensely wealthy. People who go to into lottery type uh, uh, work, you know, with very high risk of failure, most fail. A few succeed. There is the disparities in income that result are just a product of luck. So being lucky has no. I mean, I think being born smart and using your brains, I think, has uh, um, moral worth. But. Uh, merely being uh, lucky, not as a result of, not luck you have created by really being able, insightful, you know, foreseeing the future correctly, but just sheer luck, the, the, the advantages one derives from luck, the advantages one then passes on to one's children, you know, by hiring tutors so they can get into fancy schools and so forth, that uh, there's no moral defense of that. On the other hand, that doesn't mean you want to do anything about it, because if you try to do anything about it, it probably make things much, much worse off. But uh, one of the fallacies, you know, I talked about people have difficulty thinking in probabilities. One of the stupidest things, uh, the greatest fallacies, is that there is such a thing as luck. So we have an adjective lucky, which is perfectly appropriate. Some people are lucky. But they're not lucky because they have something called luck, some asset that generated a good, a good result, right? <laughs> but because we tend to, you know, so we sort of nominalize lucky and we say a lucky person is luck, we think, well, yes, a luck is one of your assets like your brains. And so if you have a huge income because you were lucky, that's the return to your asset luck with which you were born, <laughs> right? So that, but I think that's how many people think. So... So we, we, is, we, we do want to make sure that, that I mean, it would be nice if the, if the very wealthy people understood the degree to which their fortune was a product of luck. They don't go around, you know, preening themselves as geniuses because they just happen to be in the right place at the right time. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do anything about that. I don't, I don't think, uh, I mean, I think, I think it's a great thing for the United States that we have not had the kind of European um, uh, envy of, 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 of wealthy people, which results in a lot of restrictions in labor markets and so on, tax policies that reduce uh, economic growth and don't actually increase the uh, level of happiness.
a sense, the behavioral finance doesn't really pr provide an alternative to standard valuation. Valuation may not work out the way it should be. So, other than sort of now having 70 years after the fact an explanation for why we needed the 33 <laughs> and the 34 Act, uh, what else does it tell us? It doesn't, for example, seem to tell us much about the increase in executive compensation. That would be the first part of the talk. And they seem to be really unrelated because the, uh, whatever problem there is with irrationality is probably. If anything, smaller today than it was 70 years ago, because there were so many more um, uh, strong institutional players involved in the stock market. So, how far do you want to take this behavioral finance thing? Well, I didn't. I didn't tie it again. I didn't tie it in well in what I was saying. I now. I now realize what I what I had meant to uh, say was that the behavioral finance. Um, it does bear on the, ex on the ex excessive compensation issue because it suggests that the stock market is not as uh, efficient in processing information as the efficient market uh, hypothesis uh, suggests. So that means that a firm actually might derive a value from what seem rather superficial methods of concealment, such as not expensing stock options or... Um, not, uh, you know, uh, treating certain executive perks as current expenses or whatever uh, tricks are used. So there, there is that connection. But what your 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 point though about uh, weren't these problems worse uh, years ago? Uh, uh, was wasn't that your suggestion? So so why why is the pro why why is the I would think it was private equity funds and stronger institutional investment in the market. You could say that there is more monitoring coming in from the strong stockholders, so that if anything there is less worry, um, more monitoring going on from those parties. Yes, and yet um, and yet, where were the large institutional investors with uh, when, um, you know, in Enron and uh, all, all these companies were misbehaved? You know, there's that famous story about Enron. The, the analysts uh, are given a tour of an Enron trading floor, which had, in fact, ha had been completely idle. And... Enron scurried out and put a bunch of secretaries in front of laptops, and they pretended to be traders. And the analysts were, were deceived, because they didn't, none of them thought of going up to one of these people and asking what you know, he or she was actually doing, which would have unmasked the whole company, right? So, so that kind of incomprehensible failure and I think the behavioral finance people would say that um, uh, there was a kind of intoxication, you know, in the uh, late 1990s about the market. There were these, you know, people even like Alan Greenspan caught up in this. The Internet was going to transform things. So it was kind of uh, waves of emotion sweeping through the market, which had no, had no role in efficient market thinking. Oh, I think uh, I think there, there is there is certainly a motivational effect to um, this kind of tournament uh, uh, system in which you have these very huge rewards at the very top, but it isn't clear actually these benefit the companies. So, so suppose you have some more or less fixed pot of money to distribute among executives. Uh, it's not obvious that giving 90% of that pot to the number one person is, uh, and therefore only 10% to 
lesser figures in the company is more efficient than uh, reversing the percentages. Uh, I think we have a sense that, um, I, think we, I think we exaggerate the degree to which a single individual is responsible for the success or failure of a large institution. And if you think that, that responsibility, you know, causal responsibility is more diffused, you may think, well, it's actually more important to incentivize your second tier of managers than to uh, find the absolute star to be, to be your chief executive officer. You know, it's striking how, uh, how important luck does seem to play in the success of these people, because so often you read about someone had tremendous success turning around a company and so on. And then he goes on to something else, and that's a failure. Then he goes on to a third thing, and that's a failure. And so, um, and so you wonder, the, 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 more, the, the, the more that the, the success of the chief executive officer is due to luck, the less you should have to pay in order to get a, a competent CEO. Dr. Posner, thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know if any of you are about to go off to law firms. You may have just heard one of the best arguments for increasing first-year salaries of associates that you will. Uh, in any event, thank you all very much. This has been absolutely wonderful and I think a classic example of why um, everybody waits for each new article and book by Judge Posner because it uh, passes through and create, um, gives incredible illumination of every area he puts his mind to. And it's always pragmatic, always thoughtful, and always provocative. In any event, um, I would like to invite all of you to join us outside. There will be um, uh, refreshments, and I hope you can all continue the discussion there. Thank you all very much.